Matthew Henry's Commentary on the Whole Bible Leviticus 18 Here is, 1. A general law against all conformity to the corrupt usages of the heathen, verses 1-5. 2. Particular Laws, 1. Against Incest, verses 6-18. 2. Against Beastly Lusts and Barbarous Idolatries, verses 19-23. 3. The enforcement of these laws from the ruin of the Canaanites, verses 24 to 30. Cautions against idolatrous practices, 1490 BC. 1 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 2 Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. 3 After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do, and after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. For ye shall do my judgments, and keep mine ordinances, to walk therein, I am the Lord your God. 5 Ye shall therefore keep my statutes, and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, I am the Lord. After diverse ceremonial institutions, God here returns to the enforcement of moral precepts. The former are still of use to us as types, the latter still binding as laws. We have here, 1. The sacred authority by which these laws are enacted, I am the Lord your God, verses 1, 4, and 30, and I am the Lord, verses 5, 6, and 21. The Lord, who has a right to rule all, your God, who has a peculiar right to rule you. Jehovah is the fountain of being and therefore the fountain of power, whose we are, whom we are bound to serve, and who is able to punish all disobedience. Your God to whom you have consented, in whom you are happy, to whom you lie under the highest obligations imaginable, and to whom you are accountable. 2. A strict caution to take heed of retaining the relics of the idolatries of Egypt, where they had dwelt, and of receiving the infection of the idolatries of Canaan, whither they were now going, verse 3. Now that God was by Moses teaching them his ordinances there was aliquid dedicendum something to be unlearned, which they had sucked in with their milk in Egypt, a country noted for idolatry, you shall not do after the doings of the land of Egypt. It would be the greatest absurdity in itself to retain such an affection for their house of bondage as to be governed in their devotions by the usages of it, and the greatest ingratitude to God, who had so wonderfully and graciously delivered them. Nay, as if governed by a spirit of contradiction, they would be in danger, even after they had received these ordinances of God, of admitting the wicked usages of the Canaanites and of inheriting their vices with their land. Of this danger they are here warned, you shall not walk in their ordinances. Such a tyrant is custom that their practices are called ordinances, and they became rivals even with God's ordinances, and God's professing people were in danger of receiving law from them. 3. A solemn charge to them to keep God's judgments, statutes, and ordinances, verses 4 and 5. To this charge and many similar ones, David seems to refer in the many prayers and professions he makes relating to God's laws in the 119th Psalm. Observe here, 1. The great rule of our obedience God's statutes and judgments. These we must keep to walk therein. We must keep them in our books and keep them in our hands, that we may practice them in our hearts and lives. Remember God's commandments to do them, Psalm 103 verse 18. We must keep in them as our way to travel in, keep to them as our rule to work by, keep them as our treasure, as the apple of our eye, with the utmost care and value. 2. The great advantage of our obedience, which if a man do, he shall live in them, that is, he shall be happy here and hereafter. We have reason to thank God, 1. That this is still in force as a promise, with a very favorable construction of the condition. If we keep God's commandments in sincerity, though we come short of sinless perfection, we shall find that the way of duty is the way of comfort, and will be the way to happiness. Godliness has the promise of life. 1 Timothy 4 verse 8. Wisdom has said, Keep my commandments and live, and if through the Spirit we mortify the deeds of the body, which are to us as the usages of Egypt were to Israel, we shall live. 2. That it is not so in force in the nature of a covenant, as that the least transgression shall forever exclude us from this life. The Apostle quotes this twice as opposite to the faith which the Gospel reveals. It is the description of the righteousness which is by the law, the man that doeth them shall live and autois in them, Romans 10 verse 5, 
and is urged to prove that the law, law is not of faith, Galatians 3 verse 12. The alteration which the gospel has made is in the last word, still the man that does them shall live, but not live in them, for the law could not give life, because we could not perfectly keep it, it was weak through the flesh, not in itself, but now the man that does them shall live by the faith of the Son of God. He shall owe his life to the grace of Christ, and not to the merit of his own works, see Galatians 3 verses 21 and 22. The just shall live, but they shall live by faith, by virtue of their union with Christ, who is their life. Incest defined and forbidden, against marrying near relations, 1490 BC. 6 None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him, to uncover their nakedness, I am the Lord. 7 The nakedness of thy father, or the nakedness of thy mother, shalt thou not uncover, she is thy mother, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. 8 The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover, it is thy father's nakedness. 9 The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home, or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. 10 The nakedness of thy son's daughter, or of thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. 11 The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. 12 Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister, she is thy father's near kinswoman. 13 Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. 14 Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother, thou shalt not approach to his wife, she is thine aunt. 15 Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law, she is thy son's wife, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. 16 Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother, brother's wife, it is thy brother's nakedness. 17 Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter, or her daughter's daughter, to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswomen, it is wickedness. 18 Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister, to vex her, to uncover her nakedness, beside the other in her lifetime. These laws relate to the seventh commandment, and, no doubt, are obligatory on us under the gospel, for they are consonant to the very light and law of nature, one of the articles, that of a man's having his father's wife, the apostle speaks of as a sin not so much as named among the Gentiles, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1. Though some of the incests here forbidden were practiced by some particular persons among the heathen, yet they were disallowed and detested, unless among those nations who had become barbarous, and were quite given up to vile affections. Observe. 1. That which is forbidden as to the relations here specified is approaching to them to uncover their nakedness, verse 6. 1. It is chiefly intended to forbid the marrying of any of these relations. Marriage is a divine institution this and the Sabbath, the eldest of all, of equal standing with man upon the earth, it is intended for the comfort of human life, and the decent and honorable propagation of the human race, such as became the dignity of man's nature above that of the beasts. It is honorable in all, and these laws are for the support of the honor of it. It was requisite that a divine ordinance should be subject to divine rules and restraints, especially because it concerns a thing wherein the corrupt nature of man is as apt as in anything to be willful and impetuous in its desires, and impatient of check. Yet these prohibitions, besides their being enacted by an incontestable authority, are in themselves highly reasonable and equitable. 1. By marriage two were to become one flesh, therefore those that before were in a sense one flesh by nature could not, without the greatest absurdity, become one flesh by institution for the institution was designed to unite those who before were not united. 2. Marriage puts an equality between husband and wife. Is she not thy companion taken out of thy side? Therefore, if those who before were superior and inferior should intermarry, which is the case in most of the instances here laid down, the order of nature would be taken away by a positive institution, which must by no means be allowed. The inequality between master and servant, noble and ignoble, is founded in consent and custom, and there is no harm done if that be taken away by the equality of marriage, but the inequality between parents and children, uncles and nieces, aunts and nephews, either by blood or marriage, is founded in nature, and is therefore perpetual and cannot without confusion be taken away by the equality of marriage, 
the institution of which, though ancient, is subsequent to the order of nature. 3. No relations that are equals are forbidden, except brothers and sisters, by the whole blood or half-blood, or by marriage, and in this there is not the same natural absurdity as in the former, for Adam's sons must of necessity have married their own sisters, but it was requisite that it should be made by a positive law unlawful and detestable, for the preventing of sinful familiarities between those that in the days of their youth are supposed to live in a house together, and yet cannot intermarry without defeating one of the intentions of marriage, which is the enlargement of friendship and interest. If every man married his own sister, as they would be apt to do from generation to generation if it were lawful, each family would be a world to itself, and it would be forgotten that we are members one of another. It is certain that this has always been looked upon by the more sober heathen as a most infamous and abominable thing, and those who had not, not this law yet were herein a law to themselves. The making use of the ordinance of marriage for the patronizing of incestuous mixtures is so far from justifying them, or extenuating their guilt, that it adds the guilt of profaning an ordinance of God and prostituting that to the vilest of purposes which was instituted for the noblest ends. But 2. Uncleanness, committed with any of these relations out of marriage, is likewise, without doubt, forbidden here, and no less intended than the former, as also all lascivious carriage, wanton dalliance, and everything that has the appearance of this evil. Relations must love one another, and are to have free and familiar converse with each other, but it must be with all purity, and the less it is suspected of evil by others the more care ought the persons themselves to take that Satan do not get advantage against them, for he is a very subtle enemy, and seeks all occasions against us. 2. The relations forbidden are most of them plainly described, and it is generally laid down as a rule that what relations of a man's own he is bound up from marrying the same relations of his wife he is likewise forbidden to marry, for they too are one. That law which forbids marrying a brother's wife, v. 16, had an exception peculiar to the Jewish state, that, if a man died without issue, his brother or next of kin should marry the widow, and raise up seed to the deceased, Deuteronomy 25 verse 5, for reasons which held good only in that commonwealth, and therefore now that those reasons have ceased the exception ceases, and the law is in force, that a man must in no, no case marry his brother's widow. That article, verse 18, which forbids a man to take a wife to her sister supposes a connivance at polygamy, as some other laws then did, Exodus 21 verse 10, Deuteronomy 21 verse 15, but forbids a man's marrying two sisters, as Jacob did, because between those who had before been equal there would be apt to arise greater jealousies and animosities than between wives that were not so nearly related. If the sister of the wife be taken for the concubine, or secondary wife, nothing can be more vexing in her life, or as long as she lives. Laws Against Iniquity, 1490 BC 19 Also thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness, as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. 20 Moreover thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife, to defile thyself with her. 21 And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. 22 Thou shalt not lie with mankind, as with womankind, it is abomination. 23 Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto, it is confusion. 24 Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. 25 And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. 26 Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. 27 For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled winky face. 28 That the land spew not you out also, when ye defile it, as it spurred out the nations that were before you. 29 For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. 30 Therefore shall ye, ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs, which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein, I am the Lord your God. Here is, 1. A law to preserve the honor of the marriage bed, that it should not be unseasonably used, verse 19, nor invaded by an adulterer, verse 20. 2. A law against that which was the most unnatural idolatry, 
causing their children to pass through the fire to Moloch, verse 21. Moloch, as some think, was the idol in and by which they worshipped the sun, that great fire of the world, and therefore in the worship of it they made their own children either sacrifices to this idol, burning them to death before it, or devotees to it, causing them to pass between two fires, as some think, or to be thrown through one, to the honor of this pretended deity, imagining that the consecrating of but one of their children in this manner to Moloch would procure good fortune for all. The rest of their children. Did idolaters thus give their own children to false gods, and shall we think anything too dear to be dedicated to, or to be parted with for, the true God? See how this sin of Israel, which they were afterwards guilty of, notwithstanding this law, is aggravated by the relation which they and their children stood into God. Ezekiel 16 verse 20, Thou hast taken thy sons, and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these thou hast sacrificed. Therefore it is here called profaning the name of their God, for it looked as if they thought they were under greater obliga obligations to Moloch than to Jehovah, for to him they offered their cattle only, but to Moloch their children. 3. A law against unnatural lusts, sodomy and bestiality, sins not to be named nor thought of without the utmost abhorrence imaginable, verses 22 and 23. Other sins level men with the beasts, but these sink them much lower. That ever there should have been occasion for the making of these laws, and that since they are published they should ever have been broken, is the perpetual reproach and scandal of human nature, and the giving of men up to these vile affections was frequently the punishment of their idolatries, so the Apostle shows, Romans 1 verse 24. 4. Arguments against these and the like abominable wickednesses. He that has an indisputable right to command us, yet because he will deal with us as men, and draw with the cords of a man, condescends to reason with us. 1. Sinners defile themselves with these abominations, defile not yourselves in any of these things, verse 24. All sin is defiling to the conscience, but these are sins that have a peculiar turpitude in them. Our Heavenly Father, in kindness to us, requires of us that we keep ourselves clean, and do not wallow in the dirt. 2. The souls that commit them shall be cut off, verse 29. And justly, for, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 17. Fleshly lusts war against the soul, and will certainly be the ruin of it if God's mercy and grace prevent not. 3. The land is defiled, verse 25. If such wickednesses as these be practiced and connived at, the land is thereby made unfit to have God's tabernacle in it, and the pure and holy God will withdraw the tokens of His gracious presence from it. It is also rendered unwholesome to the inhabitants, who are hereby infected with sin and exposed to plagues, and it is really nauseous and loathsome to all good men in it, as the wickedness of Sodom was to the soul of righteous Lot. 4. These have been the abominations of the former inhabitants, verses 24 and 27. Therefore it was necessary that these laws should be made, as antidotes and preservatives from the plague are necessary when we go into an infected place. And therefore they should not practice any such things, because the nations that had practiced them now lay under the curse of God, and were shortly to fall by the sword of Israel. They could not but be sensible how odious those people had made themselves who wallowed in this mire, and how they stank in the nostrils of all good men and shall a people sanctified and dignified as Israel was make themselves thus vile. When we observe how well sin looks in others we should use this as an argument with ourselves with the utmost care and caution to preserve our purity. 5. For these and the like sins the Canaanites were to be destroyed, these filled the measure of the Amorites' iniquity, Genesis 15 verse 16, and brought down the destruction of so many populous kingdoms which the Israelites were now shortly to be not only the spectators, but the instruments of, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, verse 25. Note, the tremendous judgments of God, executed on those that are daringly profane and atheistical, are intended as warnings to those who profess religion to take heed of everything that has the least appearance of, or tendency towards, profaneness or atheism. Even the ruin of the Canaanites is an admonition to the Israelites not to do like them. Nay, to show that not only the Creator is provoked, but the creation burdened, by such abominations as these, it is added, verse 25, the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. The very ground they went upon did, as it were, groan under them, and was sick of them, 
and not easy till it had discharged itself of these enemies of the Lord, Isaiah 1 verse 24. This bespeaks the extreme loathsomeness of sin, sinful man indeed drinks in iniquity like water, but the harmless part of the creation even heaves at it and rises against it. Many a house and many a town have spurred out the wicked inhabitants, as it were, with abhorrence, Revelation 3 verse 16. Therefore take heed, saith God, that the land spew not you out also, verse 28. It was secured to them, and entailed upon them, and yet they must expect that, if they made the vices of the Canaanites their own, with their land their fate would be the same. Note, wicked Israelites are as abominable to God as wicked Canaanites, and more so, and will be as soon spurred out, or sooner. Such a warning as was here given to the Israelites is given by the Apostle to the Gentile converts, with reference to the rejected Jews, in whose room they were substituted, Romans 11 verse 19, etc., they must take heed of falling after the same example of unbelief, Hebrews 4 verse 11. Apply it more generally, and let it deter us effectually from all sinful courses to consider how many they have been the ruin of. Lay the ear of faith to the gates of the bottomless pit, and hear the doleful shrieks and outcries of damned sinners, whom earth has spurred out and hell has swallowed, that find themselves undone, forever undone, by sin, and tremble lest this be your portion at last. God's threatenings and judgments should frighten us from sin. 5. The chapter concludes with a sovereign antidote against this infection, therefore you shall keep my ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs, verse 30. This is the remedy prescribed. Note 1. Sinful customs are abominable customs, and their being common and fashionable does not make them at all the less abominable nor should we the less abominate them, but the more, because the more customary they are the more dangerous they are. 2. It is of pernicious consequence to admit and allow of any one sinful custom, because one will make way for many, you know absurdo dato, mil sequantur admit, but a single absurdity, you invite a thousand. The way of sin is downhill. 3. A close and constant adherence to God's ordinances is the most effectual preservative from the infection of gross sin. The more we taste of the sweetness and feel of the power of holy ordinances the less inclination we shall have to the forbidden pleasures of sinners' abominable customs. It is the grace of God only that will secure us, and that grace is to be expected only in the use of the means of grace. Nor does God ever leave any to their own hearts' lusts till they have first left Him and His institutions.